Raise your hand if you've read the book of Job. Okay, we, we have to teach Job because at some point you're going to read the book of Job. If you're a Bible reader, you're going to read the book of Job. You need to catch it correctly. Because Job has been misunderstood, kind of like Paul's thorn. What point, Paul's thorn, we talked about that last week. But Job, Job's been a, a sacred cow to hide behind when prayers go unanswered. Or when sickness and suffering comes, people say, well, I'm just like poor old Job. And it's been so identified with Christians that I've heard several, at least three, tell me or I've heard them say, yes, the first book when you become a Christian you should read is Job. <laughs> Trying to help people identify with, us, with the suffering that we face in the earth. Okay? And it's just, it's just ludicrous. Okay. Job went through a tragedy, lost his family, lost his crop, lost his everything. And so then he's in a spot with nothing. He's got boils all over him. And now he's, he's lost. He doesn't know what to do. All right? Uh, we're going to cover the first part of the story. You'll see how that happened. He, but he's in a spot and he doesn't know what to do. Now, Job, the book of Job, it looks like it's in the middle of your Bible, doesn't it? But chronologically, it's, it actually should be right at the beginning of Exodus. Because Job was written 15 years before the Exodus. So it's not chronological. So Job didn't have all the knowledge of the Old Testament, even though he's, writ, even though he's placed in the middle. Make sense? And there's proof of that. Okay, there's proof from history, and there's also proof that he never mentioned Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Moses, nobody. And everybody knew them. If you lived in the Middle East, everybody knew them. Right? The God of Abraham. They knew the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Job never mentioned that because he was written before the Exodus. All right? He had no knowledge of the covenant that God made with the human race way back then. Job had, he didn't know anything. First of all, he's before Jesus Christ, so he certainly didn't know what you know. Job is he's sitting there in, in, a, in a tragic state, like, what has happened? The only thing he did know is that there was a God. He knew there was a God who was holy and righteous. He knew that. And so the rest of Job, 42 chapters of Job, he's calling out and talking to the invisible one, arguing with his friends, they're coming in with their opinions. He's, he's saying his opinion. And they're just kind of throwing out all kind of stuff they think about the Almighty God. Some of it's true. Some of it's not true. Their conversation, some of their conversation is right. Some of it's wrong. God even mentioned, he makes note that all of them had said something wrong. Yes. Make sense? Yes. So that's where Job is. Now, that's, that's our first clue that the Christian today should not compare himself to Job across the board. How come you can't compare yourself to Job? Because Job didn't have a Savior. Job didn't have the blood of Jesus to cover him and wash him. Job didn't have an alive spirit under God. Job wasn't born again, you understand. Being born again changes a lot of things. Matter of fact, let me read from my book all the things just so I don't miss any. Can I do that? Now, this is a... Uh, this is my book, God Why. It's foundational for your life and for this church and for my heart. And that's why we preach it a lot. All right? You need it. You should have read it already. Of course, if it's your first few months here, maybe not. But you need the book. It'll help you. It'll iron some things out. It'll set you on course. It's foundational for your understanding of God. <clears throat> Let me read here about Job. Here's the, the difference between us and Job. Job lived before Jesus Christ, we live after. Amen. Job had no Savior, we have one. Job didn't have the holy blood of the Son of God. Job didn't have complete forgiveness of sins, but we do. Job had to live with his guilt, but we don't. Job couldn't pray in the name of Jesus, and we can. Job had no authority over the devil as we have. Job didn't have the Holy Spirit in him. He had no helper as we do. Job couldn't call God Father, we can. Job didn't have a covenant. He had no promises from God. He had no instructions from God. He didn't even have the Old Covenant. He died about 15 years before the Exodus. He didn't know of Abraham. If he had, he certainly would have mentioned the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he certainly didn't have the wonderful, powerful New Covenant in Christ. He had no Bible. He had no recorded words from God at all, but we do. Job had nothing, and we have everything. I believe it's a great disrespect toward God to compare ourselves to Job flat out. Except in one particular area, and I'll show you that in a minute. 
He was an upright man. And he did persevere till the end. You know, he, he did hang on to what he did know. That there was a God who would help him. And within the year, within the year, God swooped in and saved his life. And restored him. Solved his troubles. Gave him double that he had before. And he lived 140 years after his calamity. So if anybody wants to compare themselves to Job, get healed by 11 months, get double, get everything re, uh, restored back to you, and live 140 years. But don't get off feeble and say, well, I'm just like poor old Job. You know, he suffered. Yeah, but he didn't suffer like that. He was serious about getting to God. And he didn't give up. So if you want to compare yourself to Job, don't you give up. You go get to God and get healed by God. Don't you give up. Don't you get frail and weak and disappointed. You go after God with all your heart. Matter of fact, since we're on it, hold your place right there and go to Hebrews. No, let's go to James. It's in James. It's, it's, right, it's right in there, Hebrew, Hebrews. I didn't mislead you too far. James 5, it's right before Peter, right after Hebrews, verse 11 says, Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job? See, that's what you're supposed to hear of Job. Most people have never heard of the perseverance of Job. They've only heard of the suffering of Job. You've heard of the, suf the, the, <laughs> the perseverance of Job and have seen the end of the Lord. If you're using the King James, it says intended by it. That's just thrown in there. It's in italics, right? Just thrown in there. It, the, the King James says, You've seen the end of the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. Hallelujah. What is it? Why is that important? Well, healing Job and restoring Job is compassionate and merciful. Letting Job die in his sickness wouldn't have been compassionate and merciful. Psalm 145 says that the Lord is good. It says the Lord is gracious, slow to anger. It says He's slow to anger and of great mercy. The Lord is good to all and His tender mercies are over all His works. His tender mercies are over all His works. How the end of the Lord is merciful and compassionate. His tender mercies are over all His works. How do you know if it was a work of God? His mercy would be on it. Mercy and compassion is when somebody's healed and delivered and set free and restored. That's mercy and compassion. His tender mercies are over all His works. So if it's merciful and tender and something good comes... It's God's work. Amen. And if it wasn't merciful and tender and didn't come out good, it wasn't God's work. Some people would say, well, no matter what happened, God made the person sick and so that's His mercy. He's causing their heart to trust Him. He's refining their character. Not with sickness and disease, He's not. People think that. Well, I'm going through this because God's trying to perfect me. No, no, that's not how God perfects people. Not one time in the Bible does it say God perfects people with sickness, disease, and tragedy. Not one time. God perfects us with His Holy Word and His Holy Spirit. He perfects us with the Holy Spirit. He perfects us with teachers and preachers. He helps us learn His Word. He helps us get His nature. He helps us by His Spirit. He doesn't help people get perfected by causing ruckus in their life. He's trying to prepare you for the thing that might come. He's trying to save you from the thing that might come. He's trying to get you strong in faith just in case there's a speed bump in your life. And then you just step right over it. And if you're not prepared, it'll flatten you. That's God's way. Well, I didn't know none of that before. I know, I know, and I'm sorry for that. And that's why we're trying to help all the youngsters get saved and trained in the back. That's why we're trying to help everybody get saved as fast as we can so they can start now avoiding things coming. The Bible says my people are destroyed for lack of knowledge. So what do they need? They need knowledge. 
We're trying to get knowledge to them before the speed bump comes. Yes. If we can get them strong in faith before the speed bump, it'll only be six inches tall and they just step right over. If not, it'll be six feet tall and they can't get around it. Amen. Go back to Job. All right. So, the book of Job is not, a, not the story of a suffering human. That's not why Job is in the Bible. You understand? Job is not in the Bible to show you how humans should suffer. Job is in the Bible to show you how someone without a Savior and without knowledge suffers. Job is the, the most graphic depiction of the human condition before Jesus Christ. That's why he spent 42 chapters with all of this confusing arguments. The book of Job is the most prophetic cry for a Savior in all the Bible. That's what, if you read it with New Testament glasses on, you will see it's all about a Savior. It's all about a man needing a Savior. It's all about a man needing a healer. It's all about a man needing the Holy Spirit. It's all about a man without God who wants God. It's all about a man without a covenant who wants a covenant. It's all about a one who needs connection to God and he knows it, but he can't get it and he doesn't know why. And he's calling out, basically the whole time he's calling out for a Savior. You read it like that, it'll get exciting for you. Since you haven't done it yet, I'm going to take you through it. First of all, um, let me read verse 1. Chapter 1, verse 1. There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. Stop there. Just like Asa. He's a good guy, feared God, upright. But we already proved that being good and upright doesn't make any promises. It's better to be good than bad. But on its own, it doesn't get you everything you need. So he was a good guy. Look at chapter 3, verse 25. Remember, Asa didn't have any faith a couple times, right? He didn't have faith to turn to God to get help from the armies. He didn't have faith to turn to God to get healed. Look at chapter 3, verse 25. For the thing, Job says this, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me. Now wait a second. We don't believe in fear and dread. Because we have a whole bunch of promises that save us from fear. I didn't give you the spirit of fear, but of love and power and of a sound mind. That we're to be strong in faith and have not weak faith and little faith and no faith, but strong faith. And if you have strong faith, you don't have fear. And so we know that Job had a whole bunch of fear. Well, that's what people have when they don't have the Word of God. When people don't know God and they don't know the Bible and they don't have any promises of God, what else could they have but fear? So Job feared just like any human would without a Savior, without a truth, without knowledge, without a covenant, without a God, without a Holy Spirit, without any knowledge. What else can you do but fear? Right? If you, did, if you didn't know that you have a, a nine-foot angel guarding you at all times, you better be afraid. But we do see an opening here for the devil. The devil preys on fear and weakness. Yes, he does. Yep. And faith is the only thing that can stop him. That's right. Make sense? Mm -hmm. We're not putting down Job. We're just saying that's how people are without the book mm -hmm. in their heart. Yes. So, here he is in a terrible place. Lost his family, lost his health, lost his goods, lost everything. Uh, let me read you, go to chapter 6. This is, Job begins to say some things and kind of talk about his plight. The, his friends begin to say things back and they're, they've come to help him and encourage him. All they did was kind of put him down. And so this is in the arguments that they're all giving. So Job says this, chapter 6, verse 24. 
says this to God out loud, Teach me and I will hold my tongue. Cause me to understand wherein I've erred. See what he's asking? Who's he asking for? He's asking for the Holy Spirit. Jesus said, when I leave, I'll send the Holy Spirit to you and He will teach you all things and guide you into all truth. He's calling for the Holy Spirit right here. He didn't even know it. Chapter 7, verse 20. Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I'm a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? Notice he says, have I sinned? What have I done? What's he asking for? He's asking for the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one that shows you your sin. The Holy Spirit is the one that reveals to you things. And then he says, why do you not pardon my transgression? He didn't know that God pardons everybody that asks. He didn't know that God will always forgive all your iniquities. Isn't that right? Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that's within me, and bless His holy name, who forgives all thine iniquities, who heals all thine diseases. That's Psalm 103. Job didn't know Psalm 103. He didn't know God would forgive all his iniquities. He's calling out for forgiveness. And, and, and take away my iniquity. He didn't have Jesus who was laid upon him the iniquity of us all. Chapter 9, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Truly I know it so, but how can a man be righteous before God? What? How can a man be righteous before God? He doesn't know what we know. He doesn't know that we're, we're made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. That we're righteous by faith, not by works. He didn't know that Jesus made everybody righteous. Verse 3, If one wished to contend with him, he could not answer him one time out of a thousand. Because Job was clueless. Job had no knowledge to talk to God with. We do. We can talk to God as a man talks to a friend because we know God. Amen. Verse 32, For he is not a man, he's talking about God, as I am, that I may answer him, and that we should go to court together. Nor is there any mediator betwixt us who may lay his hand upon us both. Whoa, whoa, whoa! What do you mean there's no man between him and God? Exactly. Jesus is called our mediator. Jesus is the mediator between God and man. Timothy says, the man Christ Jesus. Job didn't have a mediator. He wanted one. God's showing us here what it's like without one. It's frustrating without a mediator. It's frustrating without answers. That's the human condition without Jesus and one without knowledge. It's a frustrating life. Chapter 10, verse 1, My soul loathes my life. I will give free course to my complaint. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. I will say to God, Do not condemn me. God's not condemning him. Show me why you contend with me. God's not contending with him. He's basically asking for the Holy Spirit. Show me things. Does it seem good to you that you should oppress, that you should despise the work of your hands? couple more here. Verse 14, chapter 10, verse 14, If I sin, then you mark me and will not acquit me of my iniquity. What are you talking about? I, I wrote beside that scripture, no, he's wrong. See, Job's saying things he doesn't know anything about. Make sense? He says, you will not acquit me of my iniquity? What's he saying, that God won't forgive and acquit? No, no, we know God. We know better. Job, Job didn't know better. Look at chapter 13, verse 23. How many, Job 13, verse 23, How many are my iniquities and sins? Make me know my transgression and my sin. Again, he's asking for the Holy Spirit. Look at chapter 14, verse 1. Man who is born of woman is of few days and full of trouble. What's he talking about? The Bible says length of days, long life, and peace. I'll satisfy you with long... He didn't know those, he didn't know those promises because Psalms hadn't been written yet. Right. Proverbs hadn't been written yet. Look at verse 4, 14 verse 4. Who can bring a clean thing out of an unclean? No one, he says. What? I, I got born again. How about you? 
God took me from unclean to clean in one fell swoop and I got born again. Who can do that? Well, Jesus can. He's calling out for Jesus. Look at chapter 15, verse 14. What is man that he, sh he could be pure? And he who is born of a woman that he could be righteous? He didn't know Jesus was going to be born of a woman and still be righteous. He didn't know that we could get born again through Jesus Christ and be righteous. Are you convinced? Okay. Are you sleepy? Look at chapter 19, verse 25. He says, For I know that my Redeemer lives, and He shall stand at last on the earth. Job had a prophetic sense in his heart that there is a Redeemer, there is a Mediator, there is a Savior. Somehow, somewhere, He shall stand at last on the earth. He knew more than a lot of Christians who actually have the Savior. Oh, chapter 23 has some good ones in there. But I wrote by each scripture, or by a bunch of scriptures, yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. <laughs> the, the things he's right in, I say yes. The things he's wrong in, I say no. You think that's fair? That's good. It certainly is fair. Look at chapter... Towards the back somewhere. It's going to be in here somewhere. I wrote it down. It's 38. Chapter 38. Chapter 38, verse 1 is where God, after Job complains and his friends complain for 37 chapters, God says, okay, let's, let's get them here. Okay. Chapter 38, verse 1. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? All right. So God's now going to declare, you're talking out of your ear because you don't have knowledge. Verse 3. Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? <laughs> and then God's going to go for a few chapters and challenge just speaking a bunch of truth about the Almighty that's quite thrilling. Um, but then go on to chapter 42, verse 7. So he... he, he he admitted Job didn't have all the right words. Chapter 42, verse 7, And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz the Temanite, My wrath is aroused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Alright? It's very interesting. So God now says, You guys have not spoken, and my wrath is aroused. So what you notice is God allowed Job to say a whole bunch of wrong things. Okay? But he said a whole bunch of right things as well and came out on the good side of things. Amen. Job started off moly grubbing. He started off complaining. He started, oh, what's my life? You know, why have you done this to me? Well, you're going to find out in just a moment, God didn't do it to him. It wasn't God that did this. But God only acknowledged the good things that Job said. That's how God is. He does forgive sins. He will ignore all of your rotten talking. Okay? You get back on the right track with God, He'll forget all those things. Isn't that exciting? Just like when He did with Sarah. Remember, Sarah laughed when God gave a promise they were going to have kids. Sarah laughed because she's too old. But she made it to the Faith Hall of Fame. So she must have got into faith at some point because it says, by faith, Sarah conceived a child. And God didn't even, he didn't even acknowledge that she laughed. Isn't that exciting? So he'll ignore some of your, your crazy stuff if, if you'll just get on track with him. Isn't that exciting? Go back to chapter 1. Let's start this story here so that you kind of see where people get off track with it. All right? 
Job chapter 1 verse 1, There was a man in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. Seven sons, three daughters were born to him. His possessions were 7,000 sheep and a whole bunch of stuff. Verse 4, And his sons would go and feast in their houses, each one on his appointed day, and would send and invite their three sisters to eat and drink with them, and so on and so forth. Verse 6, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now this begins, this, you have to go through this doorway of what, what, what kind of system is this? Well, the Bible says that the devil is the accuser of the brethren, that accuses them before God day and night. So there's some access that Satan has because of this whole earth thing where the, he has reign on the earth, but yet he also has access there to accuse the brethren. All right? And so, verse 7, The Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Well, that makes sense. We know that, now Job didn't know this, that the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. Now we know that now. Job had no clue. Job didn't even know there was a devil. Job had no knowledge of any devil, of what anything. So all he could do was blame God. But it wasn't God that did the thing. It was something else. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there's none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? Stop there. It looks like in our vernacular that God is pointing out Job to the devil. Like, have you considered Job? Because that's how we talk. We say, uh, if we want to remind somebody of something or bring up a good idea, hey, have you considered this? So it looks like he's saying, hey, have you considered Job? Like pointing out to Job. Well, the devil already knew Job. All right? Do you believe me? The devil already knew Job. So God's not pointing Job out. God, the devil already knows Job. Now, Technically, and you can look this up in any Hebrew linear Bible, technically that phrase, have you considered, literally means, have you set your heart on? Have you set your heart on Job? God knows everything. He's not like really trying to find out something from the devil. He's saying, I see that you've set your heart on Job. Have you set your heart on Job? Literally, with that, you can look it up. That's what that means. Should have been translated better. Have you set your heart on Job? Verse 9, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Does Job fear God for nothing? Obviously he already knew Job. He didn't need Job pointed out to him. He's already got him in his heart and God knew that. Does Job fear God for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. Now there was a day when the sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. A messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plying and the donkeys feeding beside him. When the Sabians raided and took them away, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Stop there. What is happening here? Well, first of all, you see that the, the messenger says the fire of God has come from heaven. But we know that the fire of God didn't come from heaven, came from Satan. Right. Make sense? So he's just saying what he feels. He doesn't really know for sure. Um, but you have to ask, what's going on here? Why has God allowed Satan to do this? Any rational person, why has God allowed Satan to do this? Is that what God does to us? He just picks and chooses who he lets Satan get? No, no. What you notice here is that God is forced to allow Satan to roam the earth and eat people's lunch. Whether the devil has to get permission or not, the devil has free reign in this earth to walk about and destroy people's lives until someone knows Jesus and stands up. Until someone trusts God. Until someone reaches and connects to the power of God. Until someone knows their authority in the name of Jesus. Until someone obeys uh, the Apostle Peter and resist the devil and he will flee from you. Amen. Job couldn't resist the devil. He didn't know there was a devil. Right. You understand? Yeah. God is forced because of sin to allow the devil to tempt and try everyone. 
Jesus is our remedy for sin, temptation, suffering, sickness, tragedy, danger, and evil. Jesus is the remedy. Job didn't have a remedy. So God didn't just arbitrarily want to play a game with Job and the devil. It was more like God had to. And that's why I always say God was so anticipating the cross. Oh, I can't wait to send my son so that I can have entrance in every heart and every life that wants me. It's a big deal that Jesus came. It's a huge deal that Jesus... It's everything that Jesus came. And then He gave us authority and He said, In my name, cast out demons. In my name, heal the sick. In my name, do my works. It's a huge deal that Jesus is the pivot point of all humanity. So I feel God's heart in this. Where He's like, oh, Just don't kill Him. God does not want to let the devil destroy lives. Adam and Eve let the devil destroy lives. Amen. Adam and Eve let the devil reign free. God did not want that. God was not happy that the devil got entrance in the earth. So for 4,000 years, God had to allow Satan to destroy people. But then God made a covenant. Not with Job. Job got the hand of God because he persevered. God will let anybody that has an upright heart that seeks Him with all their heart, He'll let anybody find Him. Amen. He'll let an atheist find Him if He'll start seeking Him. Amen. Amen. Thank you. <clears throat> so then, verse 21. And Job says, well, verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and saved his head, and he fell to the ground and worshipped and said, Naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked I shall return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. A lot of people close their Bible and say, let's make a song. <laughs> and we do like that song. It's got a good tune. It's got terrible, terrible, terrible words. Amen. People have taken that scripture and made doctrine out of it. I've heard it in hospitals. I've heard it at funerals. I've heard it all over the place. The Lord gave and the Lord takes away. Like it's some major scripture. It's only said one time by a man who was not filled with the Holy Spirit, who was not speaking for God, who was not in the New Testament, one time in the whole Bible is that scripture ever said. Therefore, it's not a doctrine because every word must be established by two or three witnesses. That is our rule of Bible interpretation. That is our rule of God that every scripture must be interpreted by two or three witnesses. No, nothing can be called truth unless it's two or three times, especially in the New Covenant. Even, I mean, even John Wayne got hold of this scripture. There's a... There's a movie called Red River. And every time John Wayne kills somebody, he buries them out of respect and he reads, he opens the Bible. The Lord gave and the Lord taketh away. <laughs> and after a few times of that, in the movie, in the movie, after a few times of that, his, uh, his little partner, you know, he's walking up, his little partner, why, why do you say that? Why do you say that? Every time you say that, you fill a man full of lead, stick him in the ground, read words at him. He said, why, when you've killed a man, read words at him and bring God in as a partner on the job. I'm thinking, exactly, exactly. Don't blame God and then act like he's partner. People have done that for years with tragedy and sickness and problems and, and, and stuff. The Lord gave and the Lord... That song, Blessed Be Your Name. And that's a good song, isn't it? Isn't that the name of the song? Blessed be the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord. That's a good song. But if you listen to the words, oh, it'll make you barf. <laughs> it's totally unscriptural. I mean, half the songs out there are totally unscriptural. In that song, this is what it says. When the darkness closes in, when I'm found in the desert place, though I walk through the wilderness, on the road marked with suffering, though there's pain in the offering, blessed be your name. Oh, when the darkness closes in, my Bible says God is light and in Him is no darkness at all. Hmm. When I'm found in the desert place, my Bible says there are rivers in the desert. Hmm. Though I walk through the wilderness, hmm. 
I find that those who walk through the wilderness like the Israelites were in disobedience. Hmm. Why don't you just get obedient and sing a new song? <laughs> On the road marked with suffering, what kind of suffering are you talking about? We are called to suffer as Christians, but not, like, not world suffering, not normal suffering like disease, tragedy, and all that. Christian suffering is totally different, and you're going to have it. Christian suffering is living amongst a bunch of heathen in America. Christian suffering has to do with watching unsaved family members you know, live a, an evil life when you know there's an answer. Christian suffering is getting persecuted for your faith. Isn't that right? So I don't know what they're talking about. And then there's pain in the offering. Though there's What in the world? Pain in the offering? Why don't you get in faith and give? Why don't you give offerings cheerfully? God likes a cheerful giver, loves a cheerful giver. Why don't you stop acting so silly? These people who, who write these songs, the tune is awesome. But their words prove their spiritual immaturity. So don't... We it, it, we'll sing some of those songs here and we change the words. Joni and I will make up new rhymes to fit. To fit. The Bible says that the blessing of the Lord maketh one rich and he adds no sorrow with it. Amen. So you can have pain in your offering. I'm going to have the scripture. <laughs> It'd be really, really funny if it wasn't so, so, so pathetic. Because this, kind of, this doctrine spreads all over the place because people don't read their Bible. Uh, but throughout, if you did your own study, you'd see several times he blames God. Job blames God. It wasn't God. It was the devil. It was the devil. Um, did we answer all that? Yes. We'll stop there. You can, there's more to it probably, but you get the picture. Amen. You get the picture. God's a good God. Amen. He's a God that answers prayer. If you pray it in faith, in the name of Jesus, and know what that means, and don't stop until you get it. And so we find in the Bible that if you don't stop, you'll get your answer. If you don't stop, you'll get your miracle. If you'll go after Him with all your heart, you'll get it. A lot of people want to just drive by church and get a miracle on their way to the beach. They'll give God an hour. What about seeking God with all your heart? Yeah. Well, uh, you know, I have this certain lifestyle and I'm not, I'm not real religious. Okay. All right. Yeah. All right. You can go live your natural life. Hope you make it. Amen. But if you'll seek God with all your heart, He'll let you find Him and He'll answer your prayer. Yeah. Isn't that exciting? Yeah. Job was a righteous man. He's listed with some righteous men. He's in the same category as Daniel. Some righteous men. Isn't that right? Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise the Lord. The end of Daniel, I mean the end of Job was that he lived 140 years and died being old and full of days. So if you're going to be like him, live long. You don't have to go 140, but live long. Thank you for joining us for the preaching of God's Word. We trust that your faith and your love for God is stronger than ever before. Chaz and Joni Stevenson have a New Testament vision of spreading the full gospel of Christ around the world, helping unbelievers meet Jesus Christ, and building strong Christians who can impact their world, and are doing so by preaching the uncompromised Word of God with the power of the Holy Spirit. To join us in that vision, please consider an offering to help with media costs, or an offering to simply show the value of the spiritual things you have received. You may give online by mail, or by phoning in with a credit card. If you're in Houston, Texas, and looking for a good home church, Pastors Chaz and Joni invite you to a spirit-filled, life-changing service at Houston Faith Church, where we're certain you'll experience the love and goodness of God in a real and powerful way. For more information about God, Houston Faith Church, or Stevenson Ministries, please visit us on the web, where you can now watch services via live streaming and find many other life-changing resources or download our Houston Faith phone app.